finish it up and move on to atomic emission. Any questions? Yeah, please, so that everybody can hear it loud and clear. This one? Okay. Just to show, just to dif distinguish, okay? All these dots are what standards? Containing what? They are standard solutions containing what what particular atom? What's, what analyte? What's the analyte? Strontium or, ca or potassium? Look again. Each of these indicators here show that the whole plot is solution, are solutions containing 1,000 ppm potassium. All these black dots contain 1,000 ppm. All these white dots do not contain any potassium. That's what these mean. And these, for this particular plot, all the solutions contain 1,000. For this one, 10,000. For this third upper one is 25,000. Again, I ask you, what is the analyte in question? What is the analyte that we are interested in now? What are these standard calibration curves for what element? Calibration curves are something must change with concentration. So the absorbance is changing with respect to what concentration? Potassium or strontium? Here, strontium. The analyte is strontium. Okay, calibration curve for strontium. But each of these plots, we have used different amounts of ionization suppressor. What's the purpose of the ionization suppressor? From the name, even from the name, you can answer ionization suppressor. To stop, to reduce, it may not be able to stop 100%, but to you know, suppress, reduce, have less ionization. So in this case, what, which is the ionization suppressor here? Which element is the ionization suppressor? Analyte was strontium. Is strontium the ionization suppressor? No. It's the analyte. The problem now is when you what is the problem here? Why do you need to put in potassium? Okay. The answer is potassium, of course. Okay. Potassium is the ionization suppressor. Why do you need to use an ionization suppressor here? Why do you need to add potassium to your solutions containing strontium? Why? What did we say just now? The function of the ionization suppressor was to suppress, reduce ionization for which element? Strontium. Do you want potassium to ionize completely a lot? In your solutions, in each of your solutions, now you have strontium as well as potassium. You want to suppress the ionization for which element? <laughs> Potassium, maybe I'm, ask, I'm just asking back and forth, okay? You, so if you, you got it clear, you follow me, you know, here to harapan, here to harapan, okay? Ionization suppressor is which one? Potassium. Potassium is the one that we add as an ionization suppressor. So from the name, potassium will suppress ionization for strontium. Why do we need to use potassium in this particular case? How do you explain that? I say, okay, these are the curves. Ni. Explain to me, uh, why do you need to, based on this data that we have, why do we need to add potassium as an ionization suppressor? What's the proof? Now you tell me, yes, potassium is added to suppress ionization of strontium. What is the proof? How is it that by looking at these curves, you know that, that it is necessary and when you add potassium, indeed, the ionization is suppressed.
How do you know? What's the proof back there? Red shirt. Can you speak loudly so that everyone can hear? The absorbance of? Of what? Strontium is? When? Give me, a, give me an example. Which concentration? Which plot? Because you're, as if you're going to write it down. What are you going to write down if I ask you that question? Absorbance is higher. For what? Wh which shall we look at? Which you want to look at? Tell me which plot you want to compare. 25,000 potassium, okay. Which, which concentration? Just take one, okay, this one. This black dot, okay. The absorbance is higher than? The 10,000, but not very much. Right? You take a more drastic one, which one? 1,000, but all contain potassium. What else? Go one step further. Yes, the more ionization suppressor you put in, the higher the absorbance because why here? 1,000 compared to 25,000. When I add more potassium, my absorbance is higher. Why? Less ionization of that strontium. Here, the concentration of strontium is the same huh? for all those dots. Oh, you, you didn't realize that? All this thing in the same line, you would assume like, it's the same. All the same concentration of strontium. Here also, that's what you're trying to do try to look at the difference. So from here to here, 1,000, 25,000, absorbance has increased. Why? Ionization has been suppressed. More atoms, more atoms of strontium, higher absorbance. One more. One more. One more thing. One step further. Yes, here. One step further. Compare this. This and this. 1,000 here, 1,000 here. When you do a comparison, everything else should be the same except for one factor. Then only you can make a, a conclusion about something. If you have five factors, you change all five factors, how do you know which factor influence your reading? So in this case, everything is the same. Strontium concentration the same. Potassium concentration the same. What is different between these two? The flame, the flame used here is acetylene, here is nitrous oxide acetylene. So, what's the difference? Hotter flame, therefore, higher temperature, therefore, more atoms, therefore, the absorbance is higher. Okay. And when you compare all these three, same flame, same concentration, different concentration of ionization suppressor. All, all these things, you know. One little plot can give you so much. But this is the proof. You talk about all the, theor the theory, oh, why you use ionization suppressor, why must you add this, etc., etc., you know. Here's the proof. Any more questions? Everybody got it? Got it? Ionization? And you talk about equilibrium. You know, I mean, you should say something about equilibrium. So in this case, maybe, I don't know what it... It's more difficult to ionize to strontium 2 plus, I suppose. Maybe, maybe plus only, I suppose. Now you have your potassium. Lots of potassium, high concentration. No? So you have a lot of electrons produced because this is a alkali metal. Percentage of ionization... Very high. That day, what's your what's your surname? What's your name? Which one? Eh? Shu. What's your surname? Lee. Lee. Okay. Look at strontium. Another proof. These are data you get experimentally. Okay. At two thousand, I mean that's about the temperature of acetylene. Three thousand. Let's say nitrous oxide. Just look at strontium at this lower, well, higher pressure. Like this one is uh, lower pressure. This is fraction. How to change fraction to percentage? Fraction to percentage times by? What, by what? Fraction 
to change the percentage Times by what? 100 Okay So now At the air acetylene lower temperature What is this? Times by 100 becomes 0.01% 0.01% of strontium is ionized Let's compare that to the higher temperature How, What's the percentage ionized now? 21 0.01 221 That's a big difference Okay So that's why you need um, An ionization suppressor When you are doing strontium Because strontium uh, Needs uh, Nitrous oxide acetylene So you're using An ionization suppressor Of an easily ionized element Why? Because you want it to produce the electrons But your analyte This you want to reduce This is the Ionization that you want to suppress So you have a lot of the potassium Producing a lot of electrons This will influence the equilibrium For the ionization for strontium A lot of electrons You know Lee Shatter's principle Will say equilibrium will be To the left Suppress ionization More atoms form High absorbance You know again All these things Given a thing like this This is what you're supposed to look at not just, oh, degree of ionization, you know There's a reason for that To give, to give such tables So that, that's why I said, when you read your text My notes are not supposed to be like a text It's supposed to be a guide to what you should read more about When you go into your text and you get all these kind of things This is what you have, you're supposed to read into This text is not like Do um, you ever read Peter and Jane when you were small? No for English, ada Peter and Jane books, no, okay? You did, okay? Simple. Uh, Jane, Jane went to the lake. Peter played with the ball. Okay, simple, right? Scoop is not sim that simple. In every line, you know, you might say, okay, refer to this. It just says something, but you're supposed to, okay, look into it, see these things. It's not, it's not about memorization. It's about Understanding each and every line and each and every fact is given And to convince yourself, you know, hey, how, how, how does this ionization suppressor work? Not only to see it being defined, but to see how it actually works We talk about organic solvents Okay, this last part about extraction, I, I, I said I wanted to say something about it Sometimes, your analyte concentration in your sample is too low Remember we said something about uh, Detection limit For AAS uh, Do we show Have I shown it here Ah uh, yes See different elements AAS flame Different detection limits Electrothermal will be graphite Also you know, dif different detection limits For some element, yes, you can have lower detection limits uh, When using graphite But not necessarily all huh? Not necessarily all elements So some, in your, back to the question of If in your sample, your concentration is lower than the detection limit That means what? A problem, right? That means detection limit means that's the lowest for potassium, 1 ppm This is all in, oh this is PBB Nan Nanograms per mil is PBB, 1 ppb. Your sample is now lower than that If you were to actually do the analysis <coughs> Like I said, in this digital age You will get some numbers on your screen, on the computer But it's actually noise Because it's the signal that you get from that sample, that analyte concentration on, in your sample Is lower than the signal for your lowest concentration that you can detect That's what this detection limit means Lowest concentration Lower than that is just rubbish, it's noise So if in such a case, what do we do? If we said if we have something more concentrated, you can dilute it But if you have something low, can't do much about it Okay, But that's one thing that you can do which nobody likes to do Is to do solvent extraction And I believe one of your experiments Copper Who has done that? Copper with APDC Not yet Where the analyte in your experiment will be copper You add some reagent 
some organic reagent which will complex copper okay and after you form that complex you then extract it with this organic solvent in a pardon my beautiful drawing oh terrible we don't need to draw nowadays uh, what do you call this separatory funnel to do your extraction okay with a here stop cock so copper apdc complex aqueous solution okay at the mibk organic shake it out you know done extraction already <clears throat> for organic lab <clears throat> shake 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 release some pressure shake 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 release some pressure okay the reason why you want to shake it up is so that this organic the complex will be more soluble and go into the organic phase leave the aqueous go into the uh, organic phase so in a way you now what what have you done here by forming the complex <coughs> selectively with copper you now isolate it into the organic phase so you pre-concentrate it because in here you have many other things in your aqueous phase but by doing this you have okay selectively complex your metal bring it into the organic phase <coughs> and then you may do you know several more extractions so in the end you will get your complex in MIBK in an organic phase pre-concentrated so the concentration will be higher compared to your original copper APDC in aqueous because usually volume is less right you have a higher aqueous uh, solution to begin with and then you add uh, a little MIBK 10 mils or 20 mils and then you extract then you add another 20 mils so you have reduced the volume already and you have isolated the copper so in here you what you have done is a pre concentration okay so now the co <coughs> the concentration of copper in the organic phase will be higher compared to when your original sample then you do your analysis what you do for your sample for copper you must do for your copper for your standard solutions of copper too do the extraction so your whole calibration curve will be <clears throat> copper in MIBK in an organic solvent not in water okay. what we have discussed all this while is all eco solutions your standard is in water your sample is in water you know now it's in organic solvent so we said uh, other than the fact that you want to pre-concentrate you will also get this effect where increased nebulization increased atomization plus the fact that you are now introducing MIBK, an organic solvent, into the flame. This also acts like a fuel. So you have to reduce your acetylene when you do, when you run a MIBK containing, uh, or rather, analysis of elements in MIBK. Okay. Just to show detection limits, and here you can see it again. So we have done AS for flame, non-flame, electrothermal, graphite. That's what it refers to. And this is the next thing that we will see. How if we look at one particular element. Let's say cadmium. With flame, detection limit is 1 ppb. Graphite, you can get go lower, 0.01. Um, ICP, which we will do, is this is emission, is point, uh, point zero 0.07, not as low as graphite, and the atomic fluorescence, which we will not do, uh, will be point 0.1. Flame emission, not that great. Flame emission is like your flame photometer, except that you now you don't do the flame it in the flame photometer. You do it in the same instrument as the flame emission, as the flame AAS, but you just don't have the source. You don't turn on the source. Same instrument, just don't turn on the hollow cathode lamp, and you get and you can do atomic uh, flame emission. Flame photometry is a small one using that low cooler flame, okay, uh, air and plus butane. But flame emission, we still do air acetylene. It's just that we don't have the, we turn off the source. We switch it to flame 
emission Same monochromator, same detector So you can compare, you know, it's not to say that Oh, every time ICP is lower Because in some cases, this graphite is lower Or comparable to ICP Just uh, offhand, just to say this ICP Which is the inductively coupled plasma Temperature of the flame Nitrous oxide is about 3,000 This one goes to 8 to 10,000 So you can imagine Higher temperature More atoms More ionization More excitation Okay That day, remember we talked about the hydride generation um, Just to remind ourselves what we were talking about one of the accessories of this uh, AS X did it go so back? Thought I had it. Or was that further up? Where for certain elements we run it as a we produce the hydride. We still have the flame But we have a quartz tube We have a re reaction vessel on the side Where you now add a reducing agent To your sample solution Your sample solution Does not go through a nebulizer And form aerosol We don't go through that uh, Sample introduction method anymore We now introduce the sample in a different way So you, this is an accessory Where the sample introduction Technique is different so now what we have is uh, the sodium borohydride, it should be BH4 Is a reducing agent which will then reduce our elements into hydrides And hydrides which are volatile because when you pump in nitrogen gas It will, become a, it will easily become a gas and flow with the nitrogen into this quartz tube so the hydride is a compound, a compound of hydrogen So arsenic hydride Bismuth hydrides When heated up, it will then dissociate to your atoms So your introduction is as a hydride And this is another a, a sort of a pre-concentration or procedure also like your MIBK Because what we have done is we have selectively uh, produced hydrides from only certain metals Not all metals will form hydrides So in your sample, you know Don't think that when we do analysis for copper In your sample, there's only copper There's all the other elements, okay But here, only the certain metals will form hydrides So the rest are left behind So sort of you have, you know Selectively taken what you want The elements that form the hydrides out of your sample The rest is left behind here It's not aspirated all into the flame for nebulizer, everything, everything goes into the flame So <coughs> That's what we want to just uh, look at <coughs> What elements? These are the elements, arsenic, selenium, tellurium, bismuth or oh, repetition uh, of arsenic there Why these elements? Because they form volatile hydrides for the case of mercury, it, it's a bit special because you don't need to form the hydrides You know why you should not play with mercury? When a thermometer breaks, not that we have many thermometers with using mercury now Why shouldn't you play with mercury? Did you ever play with mercury? Why, why shouldn't you? It's already, some of it is already bottleized, uh, has become a gas so, you know, you're not... Uh, mercury is uh, a toxic element You know, uh, organic forms of mercury can kill you You might want to Google that up How... I don't know, how many years ago uh, Death of a professor, I think He's had some accident Please Google that up Something about metal mercury Okay, so that's special, we don't need to form the hydrides, okay? 
Why do we want to have this hydride technique? Lower detection limits. That means higher power of detection means lower, lower detection limits. Uh, higher sampling efficiency. So I didn't give this to you because this is uh, taken from another website which I should, uh, of course, acknowledge. But this is what happens. See, this is your <coughs> reaction vessel, or rather this is, this is an online thing, so it's more sophisticated than the one I showed just now. Just now was in a re reaction vessel. Here, you do it, on, you do it in, a, in a continuous way. In, continuous. in fact, the reaction vessel is here. It's a coil, a coil, a hollow coil. So you have your acid, if you need acid, your reducing agent will be pumped by this peristaltic pump which has many channels that means one channel for your hydra for your reducing agent one channel for your acid if you need it and one channel for your sample which will then meet in and mix up with in this mixing or reaction coil okay so in this coil then you go into a gas liquid separator where you want your hydride gas to go into your optical cell in your flame the rest goes to waste. So this is the reaction vessel where your hydride is produced. The purpose of the quart cell that's heated in the flame is so that the hydride is then decomposed into your atoms, which is what you want. Okay. So the opticals, this is the quart cell which is fixed onto the <coughs> burner head. So you use, now the purpose of the flame is to heat up the quartz tube and these decompose, dissociate those hydrides to atomic species. And this is a side, side view. Uh, another way that it's done is also that you have electrical tape. Rather than using the flame to heat up the quartz tube, you use electrical means to heat it up. But same purpose, you know, to, to convert it to atoms. So this is the whole, the whole setup where, again here, <coughs> just like the graphite, each and every solution has to go through the drying, ashing, atomization cycle. Similarly here, each and every solution has to undergo that uh, through the coil and form the hydride, etc. Each and every one. Why here? Certain elements, lower detection limits. Like I said, mercury is somewhat different don't need to form the hydride. All you need to do is to your solution containing your mercury, mercury, you add reducing agent to form mercury and that, and when you push, when you pump in uh, some inert gas, that, that mercury will volatilize, go into that tube. So that's why you call it a coal vapor mercury technique. Why do you want to use this technique? It gives you lower detection limits. And of course, <clears throat> very selective because <clears throat> not all atoms, not all elements are volatile, as volatile as uh, mercury. So you use a diff somewhat different reducing agent, stannous chloride. The tin will reduce the mercury in your sample to the mercury vapor, which will then go into, still you need your quartz cell, and the mercury will absorb at 253.6 nanometers in the UV region, okay? Elements, if you choose uh, a wavelength in the UV region, most likely it's better to do background correction. Because sometimes you get this molecular absorption uh, in the UV, UV region. Oops, okay, that's about it. So, okay, for the hydride, when you say hydride technique, arsenic, bismuth, tellurium, uh, and some other metals. And uh, that's one that I remember. Need to form the hydride. Coal vapor, same kind of idea except that no need to form the hydride. The reducing agent will reduce the mercury in your, sam in your solution to mercury vapor. No need to heat the quartz tube because it's already in atomic form, okay? unlike the hydride. Any questions? Because we will leave 
AS. For those who did not get that article that I sent, can you just ask your friend to forward it to you? I think I sent one application, application note on uh, Flame AS. I don't, I don't remember what it is. What? Have you looked at the paper? What was it? Analysis of what? Rice. Elements in rice. So and they had to do some digestion. Because as we see for AS, your solution must be, uh, your sample must be in the solution form. The only uh, thing that for graphite, it may be, you can do blood. But blood is not solid, okay? Blood is a very homogeneous, you can think of it as a very homogeneous, thick solution. So if you can, <coughs> let's say, if, <coughs> if you had your meat sample, meat sample that you want to analyze and if you could blend it up to find to form very small particles and and the solution will be somewhat like blood and you call it a slurry so slurry yeah? something like blood so you've managed to homogenize your sample to very fine particles and it's thick, then you can use graphite to analyze directly. It doesn't have to be in a solution. But if you read that article, I'm sure if your sample is a solid, you have to, <coughs> uh, your sample has to undergo some pre-treatment to change it into solution. So solid to solution, usually you have, you undergo uh, acid digestion, okay, where you add acid to your sample and you use the microwave digester or you use a hot plate to ultimately uh, <coughs> um, eliminate all your organic matter everything will become into solution you know um, all what whatever if your sample is organic based um, or the other types of uh, another type of uh, sample treatment is dry ashing where you essentially put your sample in a furnace which may go up to 500 degrees centigrade. Again, the purpose is all your carbon will then become you know, CO2 and lead and you are left with a white ash. Your sample is just everything, all the organic has been burnt out. And after that, you dissolve in acid, then only you run it on your AS. So all these different kinds of <coughs> sample pre-treatment that I'm sure in in either Christian or Scoop, you can get a chapter on, you know, talking about this. They call it digestion, not digestion in your stomach, but digestion in a vessel. To the purpose, still the same. If you digestion in your stomach is, you know, it changes into something so that your blood can absorb it, right? So this is the same thing. Your sample, now you, your digestion techniques are so that you get a clear solution. If you don't get a clear solution, you put it into your tiny capillary, it'll be stuck, clogged. You know, and so, so you want, the, ideally when you do digestion, you want from your sample, you get a clear solution. You don't want to have particles and filter. You may have to do that, but I don't like to do it because why? Those, in those black particles, maybe you still have some of your element. So if you filter and just analyze your solution, you have, uh, not, you have left out what elements are left in your whatever particles that was in your solution. But sometimes, you know, life is not so ideal and we do have to filter. No questions on AS? Flame, non-flame, graphite, hydride generation, coal vapor. Those are the different things. Comparison in terms of detection limits, uh, selectivity, sensitivity, how to calculate sensitivity. Oh, did we go through that now? But we did the definition. In chapter one, you did the definition uh, in for when you want to measure sensitivity. What is the absorbance? What is the concentration that will give you how many? 1% absorbance. 1% absorption equals to 99% transmittance. Oh, please calculate that. If you have 99% transmittance, what is the absorbance? It's either an extra zero or something. You know what I'm trying to get at? 
the definition of sensitivity. How to find the sensitivity for different elements using the same technique. So you can find. For AAS, different elements will have different sensitivity. How do you calculate sensitivity or def definition of sensitivity is the concentration of that element which will give an absorbance of 0 0.00. We go and, please go and calculate. And tell me by Monday whether it's three zeros or one zero. But the definition is concentration of the element which will absorb 1% or where the transmittance is 99% T. So from that, you can call, convert what it is. So how you find this? You can do your calibration curves. Find where A is equal to 0 0.00044, what is the concentration? That is sensitivity. And you'll find that different elements have different sensitivity. Just like the detection limit, different elements have different uh, detection limits. So sometimes it's a question of, I want to use a method with lower detection limit. Sometimes you want something which is more sensitive, you know, so it depends. Okay, from AAS, we now move on to atomic emission. Um, to get our story right, M still is used for analysis of metals. For AS, you produce atoms in the ground state. Some of it get excited, gets uh, to be an excited state M star, but this is not, the lifetime is short, it will go down and re relax. But in AS, we measure how much is absorbed. This is uh, absorption, AS. Now we talk about atomic emission. Yes, you still need the thing to be excited, the electron to be excited to a higher energy level. Upon coming down to ground state, it may emit light. In emission, we measure how much is emitted. So for AS, we measure how it is dependent on the atoms, ground state atoms. The more ground state atoms you form, the higher the absorbance. For emission, is dependent on how much is excited, how many is it, how much uh, excitation is uh, occurs. Because the more, the greater excitation, the more probable it will come down and emit radiation. So we measure. That's the two difference now. If in AS we're talking about A, your plot, your calibration curve is absorbance versus concentration. Here, no more. Don't talk about absorbance. You're talking about emission units. There's no units, it's just numbers, you know. There's no, there's no units to it, just as absorbance has no units. So your, your calibration curve will be emission intensity versus concentration. So as we see here, this is just a basic, a very basic um, diagram showing the, uh, the main components in atomic emission you must have some form of uh, one component that produces the atoms. Because before the atoms can be excited, you must produce the atoms first. You must produce the ground state atoms. So you need an atomizer. So we can use a flame, or we will see that if you don't use a flame, you use some hotter source. Of course, it must have heat. How are you going to change your, because your here is the same thing, the nebulizer. In flame emission, you still have your nebulizer, you're introducing your sample as a solution, forming aerosol, etc., etc., and then the atoms form here. And another function of the flame for atomic emission will be to excite it. So energy of the flame not only forms the atoms, the dissolvation, volatilization, dissociation, etc., it also is the source of energy for excitation to uh, of the of the atoms to uh, an excited state. And then you have a wavelength selector. Why do you need a wavelength selector? Because your sample contains many, many elements that may all be excited and produce and give out the characteristic radiation. But at any one time, you want to only look at one element. So you want to look at one wavelength. So you need a wavelength selector. And of course, your detector. 
here we talk about scanning instruments where your wavelength selector for your AAS, it's only you have to set the wavelength. If I want to do copper, I set at 3 to 4 nanometers. Here, we can do a sort of a scan the wavelength. I can say, okay, I want to look at between 300 to 600. So I scan the wavelength and it does that automatically. I set, it, I set the lower limit and the upper limit and the instrument will scan it according to a certain rate. And we can say that we want to take readings at 3 to 4, at 400, at 450. So we set. So at those particular uh, wavelengths, it will take a reading. Okay? So in that case, with atomic emission, maybe not with a flame, we can do what you call multi-elemental analysis, where you do you know, one element after another. For AAS, not so possible because you have you look at one element at a time. Okay, you have to change the, the lamp and then set a different wavelength to do another element. But here, no need to change any source. Just change the wavelength and you're looking at a different element, a different wavelength, which is uh, related to a different element. Many, into many interferences. And with, uh, <coughs> with atomic emission, another difference is you need a higher resolution monochromator. With your AAS, because your hollow cathode lamp gave out only certain wavelengths, so your wavelength selector is not, it's not so crucial that the resolution must be so high because the lamp only gives out certain, element, uh, certain lines. But here, you just imagine you get all kinds of things given out and all will fall on the entrance slit of your monochromator. So your monochromator must be higher resolution, more selective, you know, if you want to differentiate between elements which uh, wavelength which are close to one another. Because it wants to distinguish one wavelength from another. Okay? So you, you need a, high, a higher resolution instrument when you do atomic emission. So when you talk about source in atomic emission, you don't talk about a lamp. You talk about the source of your emission where you get your atoms emitting light. So it can be a flame, lower temperature compared to a plasma, which is, which is two, three, uh, two or almost three times hotter. Now you call them sources, but you call them excitation sources. You don't call them, they are not sources of light per se, like your hollow cathode lamp or your electroless discharge lamp. They are now excitation sources. So you have the flame or the plasma. The flame is the same flame that we saw in AAS. to look at that first, I suppose. Atomic emission, FES, flame emission spectroscopy. The excitation source is the flame. Acetylene, nitrous oxide, acetylene, what have you. The simplest kind, the one really on the lower end is the flame photometer which you use to do what analysis? Remember who has done that? Has everybody got a chance to do that yet? to do flame photometry? What, sodium? Sodium analysis. And you... Calcium. Calcium. And you add some... No, 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 that's AAS, I think. I don't think we do calcium for that. Or rather, I'm not... Whatever it is, that's small. It's a small instrument. Uses cooking gas, butane plus air. No tank, big tank of acetylene, okay? Flame pun like a Bunsen burner. So simplest instrument for FES, but quite important in analysis, in clinical or agricultural analysis, because you use it for mostly alkali metals, calcium, barium, not, not more than that, you know, for, for that instrument, because it uses a lower temperature flame. So 
which is good for alkaline metals because you don't get your too much ionization. Low temperature, okay, and no monochromator, just some kind of filtering system and some simple detectors. So, nothing, um, you know, yes, it's a simple instrument, cheaper of course, but it has its uses. Okay, now we go back to if we don't use the flame, we use the plasma. And what is the difference there? The flames that we were talking about, the air acetylene or the nitrous oxide, is within this range. And you have done the N excited over NO, right? You have calculated that. In the, some of you have got it already, some of you have not got your assignment yet. Where you saw, uh, compare the when it's 1,800, the temperature is 1,800. What was the fraction of excitation uh, excited compared to when it was 3,000? Higher, more excited, right? So, um, in terms of number of excited atoms form, it is actually not even 50%. Not even 50% are excited. Less Even at that 3,000, I think it was like a, what was it, some small fraction. Only a small fraction gets excited, okay, from the number of ground state atoms which are originally formed in the flame. So, flames, because of that, are more suited for AAS. AAS is dependent on number of ground state atoms because this is the one that will absorb the light. In emission, you want your, cent your focus on the number that got excited because it's the excited atoms that will come down and release that light. And that's the light that you want to measure. So if the number of excited uh, atoms is less, your emission intensity will be lower. Okay? So that's why you now go to the plasma, which was probably, you know, um, commercially available probably in the late 70s or early 80s. I mean, you're talking about you're not even born probably. So, flames, you still can do flame emission. You still can do it. I mean, it is possible to do flame emission with flames. Uh, maybe you won't get that low detection limits, but it is possible. How do you do flame emission just now I said? How to do flame emission with our AAS? Same instrument, AS are the source, flame, monochromator, detector. How do I use the same instrument for flame emission? I can still here have the nebulizer, the burner head, the flame, the monochromator, detector. What doesn't need to be there if I want to do flame emission? Don't need. Don't need which one? Which component of the AS do I now get rid of in order to run flame emission? Here. Upper. Which one? You understand what I'm trying to ask? How I said by now, you must have this imprinted in your brain. The schematic diagram for AS. Source. Flame. Monochromator. And what have you? Detector, then signal processing. In your brain, okay? Sample. This is for AS. Want to measure absorbance. So you want to measure how much in these atoms form here, how much of this light is absorbed? AS. What I say the same equipment can be used for flame emission. Which component do we get rid of? I heard some saw some somewhere else say something there. What did they say? ACL, okay, okay, okay. The source. No need for the source. Because why? We are not measuring how much light is absorbed. We are centered here. We want to know how much light is given out by these at excited atoms in the flame. So, no need for the source. 
same equipment but just used for flame emission. Then you, you have your plasma, high temperature. Higher temperature, which means that what will be the difference? Flame and plasma with a higher temperature. Oh dear. Last one. When you go from 3000 to 8000, if you were to go and calculate that same um, problem in your tutorial, if you go now, if you were to use 8000, maybe you should do, do that after this. Huh? That same equation, calculate 8000. What would be the percentage? Number of excited uh, atoms. I'm sure it will be a lot. Uh, you can tell me by Monday, 8,000. Number of excited states will be increased tremendously. So, this is one of the reasons why we have moved from the flames to the plasma for emission. So, now when you talk about emission spectroscopy, it's usually plasma, it's not so much the flame. Okay? That's it for today and